How many of you brought your little book today with you today? Very good. Look good, you good students. All right. If you have not yet received one of these books and you would like to have one and you're going to attend services here, then I would recommend that you get one. And Lonnie has some. Do we have extras, Lonnie, back there? Okay. If somebody needs one that has not yet received one and you would like one, uh, Russ and Jen up here, these backsliders that were gone last <laughs> week or so. They were protecting us from COVID, so that's why they weren't here last week, which we appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? That, please. These are, these are basically, uh, this book is going to be used as our outline for Sunday messages. And uh, as you will see, last week we talked about God's Word as our foundation, and we kind of summarized some things in that lesson because it was just a handout to you last week. But today happens to be lesson two, and it's called The Attributes of God. And so what we're going to try to do is, uh, for the next 10 weeks, I know we have a missionary next week, so you would be doing the next lesson on your own, possibility uh, that we'll share just a couple of things in regards to that so that you stay uh, in line with us. And then we get to week four, and I've told Abe that he's going to talk about last times, but he's going to talk about the Trinity when he does it, because... <laughs> Uh, that's lesson four in here. So we're going to try to stay on schedule as well as this topic and as well as you're doing these lessons are filling in the blanks for yourself that they, it's helpful for you when you see all these different things that we're uh, trying to do. God speaks to us in a variety of ways. And mostly God wants to always speak to us about who he is. He said again, God wants to speak to us and he wants you to know who he is. Who he is. It's very important that you realize that because if you heard the world news and you didn't know who God was and what God said about these present days, then it would be a very scary time for you. Times of uncertainty. In fact, people do a lot of crazy things when they come to a sense of hopelessness. And if you don't know who God is in your life, you will come up with a hopelessness in your spirit that often drives you to things that are not positive. They're often very negative. In fact, those who commit suicide basically are at the point of hopelessness. And the devil would like to drive you all to the cliff of hopelessness. The devil would like you to end yourself in some way horrible and we must come against that, and we come against that voice, we come against that kind of a thought, negative thought pattern, by knowing who God is in our lives. So important. I'm gonna open my Bible, so, because you said I preach from the Bible, I better open it and do that, because it is important. I think my first scripture I wanna to refer to is Psalms 145. And again, uh, this is what I want to say about your booklet. When you're looking at your booklet, and you're, I want you to write down things. I want you to take notes and fill them in as we go along, and I'll try to stay somewhat with the outline. But I'm going to add my own personal thoughts as the Holy Spirit, I believe, directs me and gives me an understanding of what needs to be said to you. So you need to understand that as well. But oftentimes, when you're hearing somebody speak, just like me, you'll have a thought. Probably the most important thing in the world is the thought that you come up with. And you need to write it down. Think about that. The most important thought that you have, you already had thoughts in just the first five minutes of my conversation with you today, you've had some thought about God. What is it? Write it down. Respond because the Holy Spirit, I believe, is speaking to us and through us all the time. And we need to grab those moments, those nuggets, those things which are life giving to us, which give us hope instead of hopelessness, which makes, gives us peace instead of uh, fear. Those are the things you want to hang on to and make sure that they become your message. And this is your message, just, just an outline, not trying to get through a book that has certain thoughts in it, but making sure that you and I are hearing what God is saying to us 
and we're responding to him and reflect upon our understanding of his attributes and that they are unchangeable. God's attributes are immutable. He is incapable of change. If you didn't write it down, you should. God is incapable of change. He's immutable. That's his character. That's his attribute that we must hang on to. The longer you live for him, the longer you experience him, the longer that you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you, the longer that you hold hand in hand, and the song, a couple of the songs that sang, and, and I think uh, June even sang, that when we walk with the Lord through the periods of time that we have, we find that he is always there, and we find that he's constant, and he is comforter to us. He's a help to us as we experience the path of life that has been dealt to us. And you will see, because your life is different than my life, you will see God and his attributes possibly in a different way, but they're God, still all the same. When I was a young man, how I many know I was young once? I'm going to look at that bucket. I may kick the bucket before this is over, so anyway. Who knows? Charcy's dad always said he wanted to die in the pulpit. I guess that's... And you know what? He was preaching one night, didn't feel good, turned around and knelt at the altar behind him pulpit and went into a coma and never wow. awake and went to be with Jesus. What a way to go. What a way to go. He was quite a character, Charcy's dad. Lester Sheets was his name. But Lester Sheets taught me oftentimes the attributes of God working in his life, in our life. So when you deal with those kinds of life experiences, don't let them be wasted experiences. Amen. Let them be learning, teaching experiences that God has given you. I started to say a moment ago, you know, man, in January the 24th coming, uh, 2024, I would have preached my first sermon January 24th, 60 years ago. That's a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks, June. <laughs> You're supposed to be helping me out here. So I understand 60 years of pastoring, ministry. I was a young man, I was 19 years old, preaching to a group of Indians on the island of British Columbia Vancouver Island. And as I was asked to speak to this group of people, which was kind of an interesting beginning of my ministry, how many know that God starts us oftentimes down areas and paths that we never planned it? I was helping a friend of my dad's get to uh, drive up to Vancouver, British Columbia, and then take the ferry boat over to Vancouver Island and go to uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia. <laughs> and there began to minister to the Indians who were forming what they call the West Coast Indian Fellowship of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. The gentleman I was with was the head of the Indian, North American Indian Ministry for the Assemblies of God. His name was George Effman. And George Effman asked me to drive with him. And so I left school to help drive. I called my dad, got permission. My dad and George were personal friends. I ended up driving to with him on January 20th of 1964. And we got to Nanaimo, we got to the, the big house that they were holding their services in. And all these dignitaries from all these different church organizations were there. And all these uh, Indian folk from the island of British Columbia, or, or Vancouver Island, were there to form this group and do all the business. And one of the leaders said, we want to hear the Wisa preach. That was January the 24th, 1964. I turned around and George said, Randy, they want you to preach the two o'clock service. I said, you gotta be kidding. I had one sermon in my Bible, Muhammad class. 
And uh, the sermon is entitled, Be Willing to Be Willing is to Be in the Will of God. And I got up and hooped and hollered for about 20 minutes, about all I could last, and went on. And the superintendent of Canada, a man by the name of Lynn, Carmen Lynn, came to me afterwards and said, how would you like more experience? <laughs> and I, I think that was a hint. <laughs> he was being gentle. Well, I knew it was a hint when he said, we can't get a real evangelist, but would you be willing to go <laughs> to the islands and start preaching? And uh, he said, I'll give you $20, and I'll buy you a bus ticket to go from Nanaimo up to Campbell River. From Campbell River, some of you know the Vancouver Island, great fishing. You're a salmon fisherman, incredible salmon country the inlet passage all the way up to a place called Alert Bay. And Alert Bay is a small little island called Comert Island. The town is called Alert Bay. And I would take this boat and go all the way to, the, uh, to that destination. I waited in the uh, bus depot for my bus to take me to Campbell River. And while I was there, I had my Bible, but I thought I needed something to help me put sermons together. I had $20, so I used part of that money to buy a book written by Billy Graham entitled Peace with God. They had a book rack there. That's when the days when they let religious books be in a bus depot. I took that book, Peace with God, and my Bible, and that became my commentary, my sermon material for the next six months. And I preached every night. And other than travel time, all the way up through the Inlet Passage, Alert Bay, Port Hardy, uh, Bella Bella, Bella Coola, all the way at Fort Rupert, got over into uh, uh, the mainland, and it's a story in itself, all the way up to the Yukon Territory in Dawson City, Yukon Territory. And I ended there, and the, I preached to a few Indians that would come out to the service. And I remember, I still have real to real tapes of me preaching at Bella Bella. Oh, wow. And telling my folks, I sent it, that's how we communicated those days. I sent it back to my folks and said, six people got saved tonight. There was only 12 here, but 50% isn't bad. <laughs> I only tell you that kind of crazy story to let you know that God has been faithful to me, even though at times I was not faithful to him. He was always there, all the time. He was going before me. He was on both sides of me. He was behind me. He was everywhere I needed him to be. And he was that for me. And you know what? I believe for everyone that I've preached to for 60 years, he's been there for them all the time and you are part of those that God is speaking to and God is moving in your heart and changing you and you're experiencing him and his incredible ability to make sure everything in your life is going to be okay no matter what the devil might try to tell you no matter what the devil might try to do to Israel, as the God who's going to be faithful to Israel, he will be faithful to you. Psalms 145. Some great verses, starting in verse 13. My eyes are watery, so I've got to put my glasses on so I can see here. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. This is Psalms 145, verse 13. I'm going to go back up to verse 11. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Now verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. How long, church? All generations. 
What is it? The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open their hand and satisfy the desires of just a few. Oh no, of every living thing. God is powerful. God is able to provide for each and every one of us. Attributes are a quality or a feature regarding a characteristic or an inherent part of someone or something. Let me say it again. It's a quality or a feature regarded as a characteristic or inherent part of someone or something. We know that God's attributes are who he is. It's the quality of the features and his characteristics of who he is in this world. I know there are absolutes about God and your life, your Christian experience, your infilling of the Holy Spirit, all are backing up the fact that his attributes are forever and ever. Amen. Man, God's attitude, attributes are expressed and demonstrated in his word over and over again. We must come to a realization of God as revealed by the Holy Spirit through the living Word of God. So the whole series of lessons that we're going through today, and we'll go through the next 10 weeks, all has to do with the Word of God being the foundation of everything else that we are going to live out. It's our experience and our expression of him. So let's go to your lesson. I'm going to first ask you at the top of the page, what is God like? If you were to write down something in this lesson book, it actually asks you, what is God like? So let me ask it this way. What is God like to you? What is God like to you? Write something down. And then I'm going to ask you maybe to express it to me, if you would, in just one. Who is God to you? Maybe it's another way of putting it. <laughs> Somebody's cheating. <laughs> Wikipedia has an answer. Thank you. Who's ever phone that was? Was that you, Rox Roxanne? Was that you? Huh? I don't know. So I, boy, that's good. What is, so what would you express to me? You're going to write it down it's right there at the top of your book on page, uh, what, page 16. That it says, what is God like? What? My father. He's your father. Come on, church. Shepherd. Faithful. Creator and savior. Savior. Friend. Consistent. Love. Mighty. Always present. Always present. Just and merciful. Just and merciful. Lyle, good to see you. Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. Holy. Holy. See how we can start relating to that? And you've learned that how? <laughs> Through life experience. That has been proven to you. That's why it comes to your mind who he is. Some of you today need him to be healer. Some of us today need him to be deliverer. Some of us today need him to be savior. We need him in the area of our need, and he shows up in that specific area. So you must declare that he is God in that area of your life. If you go to Exodus, let's go to Exodus. You've got it in your scripture and your text there, Exodus 34. Exodus 34 is... Moses talking to God, of course, or God talking to Moses, actually. Moses, uh, Exodus 34. I love this story. 
I don't know if I'll have time. What kind of time we got here? We got lots of time? Okay, good. Good, good. Good. It's only 1224. According to Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, Exodus 34. God declares his attributes to Moses, right? So here it says, so Moses... I need to, my glasses today for some reason. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. I, I got to pause there just for a moment. I got to tell you this because it's very interesting to me. If you go back just a, a chapter or so, you find that Moses, how many know that Moses had a temper issue? <laughs> he, he had a temper issue. He comes down off the mountain with the tablets, the first set. And who wrote on the first set of tablets? God, with his finger. Can you imagine the value of those? And God wrote out on the tablets what the Ten Commandments were to be. But Moses, when he comes down off the mountain and sees the children of Israel, decided they, they couldn't wait for him to come with the word from God. And they, de and they decided to take all their gold and put it together, melt it down, and make themselves a golden calf and begin to worship their gods. Well, when Moses saw that, Moses came down. Of course, God wasn't happy either, but Moses came down and he throws the tablets down and he breaks them up. Well, what's interesting to me now in chapter 34, we find that God does something very interesting. He takes... Instead of God writing on them with his finger again, he tells Moses, chisel them out. There's always some punishment based on the fact of your response to what's going on. I wonder if he had just hung on to those original tablets. Everything had been all right. But God told him to go ahead Sometimes our, well, my point is this. Sometimes our anger gets us into trouble. And we end up having to go through and do things that God never originally planned for you to do. And sometimes it's much harder to climb the mountain the second time than if you had just been obedient and trust God to take care of the circumstance. That's a good place to say amen. Yeah. Amen. amen. Bless your heart. So Moses, here he is. He's having to chisel them out. He's having to work on these stones. And it goes on to tell us then, listen to this. Now God, after all of this, uh, chisel out the two stones, he tells them in, the, in verse 4. And so the first uh, ones went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. Then the Lord came down in the cloud, stood there with him, and proclaimed his name. Here it is. Who proclaims his name? God proclaims his name. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Now, read for the NIV. Different versions have some different words there, but they may basically mean the same. He goes on, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Then Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. There's something about when God declares who he is and what he wants to do in our lives that causes us to realize that we can list the names of what, who he is, what he's accomplished, who he is, but it should bring us to a place of humility and bowing down and being a brokenness before him. When I read this, the last couple of weeks, been studying the scriptures and understanding what God is trying to say to us, my, I'll admit to you, I ended up being very broken before the Lord. 
realizing that how gracious over these 60 years of pastoring that God has been to me and how gracious he is to allow me to shepherd, pastor, be involved with you. And how over the years that he's expressed that he is Lord of my life, meaning he's in control of what's taking place. The Lord is someone who's in control of your life. So I must ask you, is God the Lord of your life? I must ask you, do you know of his compassion and his love towards you? So it tells us. Someone's expressed already, he has shown his faithfulness to you. He is constant. He is always there. Have you experienced his correction in your life? He's not done with us either, is he? So he deals with us in all these attributes that represent who he is. Uh, let's go to God is love, 1 John 4, all the way back in your New Testament now. And let's go to 1 John real quick. You guys doing okay? Are you comfortable or are you too warm? I want you to know there's a wonderful lemon cheesecake back there that someone brought to the church that uh, in, as a, a nice gift uh, for me and I'm sharing it with you. So there's lemon cheesecake back there after service. So if you hang in there with me, you'll, uh, you'll get that. Let's just look at 1 John 4 real quick and read some of these scriptures that are so powerful in regards to that God is love in our lives. And you can write out the other scriptures in your own personal time. So let's start with verse 7. Dear friends, this is chapter 4, 1 John. Let us love one another. For love comes from whom? God. Comes from God, doesn't it? Because that's God's attributes, God's character is who he is. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. <laughs> because God is love. This is how God sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another God lives in <coughs> us and his love is made complete in us let me just pause for a moment do you ever find it easy to express love to a stranger than it is to your own spouse interesting thought isn't it I've done enough marriage counseling and been with people that have lived together for a while and it's amazing how hate becomes part of a relationship. Boy, I got quiet in here. <laughs> and yet, we can have a stranger knock on the door and ask for something and, whoa, come on in. And you just do whatever we can for whatever, whomever. And sometimes our own family, our own children, our own spouse, our loved ones, we sometimes have a hard time because, after all, Pastor, they hurt us. You ever been hurt by a kid, or by a spouse? I feel the Holy Spirit really is speaking to me in regards to that because I, I have kids that I love very dearly. Have they always been perfect? Do they always do things the way that dad would like them? No. Probably in some ways that's good. <laughs> How about you? When it comes to your loved one, and what God is saying about this, uh, we can quote these scriptures, that God is love, and God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us, then we must always show ourselves totally and completely dictated by the attribute of God living in us 
and through us to those that are the closest to us that have the ability to hurt us the most. The more I serve the Lord, the more I realize I have to allow that spirit of love. Try to just birth in me more and more. And it goes back to what I'm thinking that Moses must have felt like when he bowed down and worshiped God because he realized his love wasn't up to what it should be in regards to dealing with the children of Israel that he was trying to deliver. And they were out rebelling. Don't you just hate that? And yet he had to bow down and break before Almighty God because he realized just what John is saying, that God's love dwells in me and it's complete in me Amen. to all the world that God places me in. Powerful words when they are spoken in church. If we are to be all that God wants us to be, if you're to be all that God wants you to be, if you're to live the life that God desires for you and have fulfillment, there must be a bowing of our hearts before Almighty God and say that we need more of your love in us and more of your love through us for a dying and lost world. They need the love of God. And it must come through the church of Jesus Christ. We know that we live in him and he in us. Think about that. We know that we live in him and he lives in us because he has given us of his spirit. So anything that's going on in your life, the attribute of God that's wanting to be birthed in and through us to a lost and dying world and even to those that are the closest to us. The Holy Spirit is given to us to make it happen. And he gives us opportunity to express it. Verse 14, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And we know and rely on the love God has for us. What do we rely on? God's love for you. You must know God's love and that he loves you. Turn to somebody and just tell them, God loves me. Doesn't matter what you think. God loves me. There is nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God. Nothing. That's the promise for your backslidden kids, your grandkids, or your loved ones, or your spouse. God will always love them. And you and I, because he will always love them, must also love them. Why is it strong in my spirit? <clears throat> so we know and rely on the love of God that he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Let me just pause this. I said Wednesday night something about God hates sin. And I believe he hates sin because sin separates us from God. But God loves the sinner. 
for I am one. You are one. And he loves you. But he hates the sin that wants to separate us. <coughs> he hates it. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because the, he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command Whoever loves God must also love Pastor Randy. <laughs> you put your name in there. It's all right. There's so many things. So God has declared his attributes to Moses. We see all of that list. Uh, I have a long list that I was going to read off to you that uh, you probably don't need me to do it, but he... His commands, his decrees, God's, his foreknowledge, his sovereignty, his holiness, his grace, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness. These are all things that are characteristic of God. And as the last point of that lesson says, God is eternal. We read it in Psalms 145 that his kingdom, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Amen? Amen? Our memory verse that you have in your book and it tells you this. Forever, O Lord. How many? Forever, Forever. O Lord. Let's read it together, everyone out loud, please. Forever. Forever, O Lord. Your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. That's what he has promised to all of us. The attributes of God. Who is he to you now? And what will he be to you tomorrow? And the next days? Who is he to you when the doctor tells you you have an incurable disease? Who is he to you when you have given in to a temptation and you know it's sinful. Who is he to you? Who is he to you when your kids cuss at you? Turn them back on you. Deny your parenting skills. Who is he to you? important that we understand that he is a loving God through it all. And he, through his love, has made us complete. Complete. Think about it. In his love, God is love, and in his love, we are made complete. I'm whole. I'm all together. I'm not dissected by the devil or by fear or anxiety or depression. But I am whole because of his love that dwells within me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for being able, Lord, to minister to us in such a variety of ways. Thank you for such a desire by this congregation to know more about you in your word. And truly, as you expressed yourself to Moses way back at the beginning of time, and now you express to us here through the love message in 1 John, and you just stamp it as eternal for all generations, and we're part of that. We thank you for it. 